Uh, let's get started. My name is Daniel Hess. I'm the chair of the Urban Planning Department here at the University of Buffalo. Uh, and we welcome you to our Wednesday lecture series. If it's your first time, I'd like you to know that we have regular Wednesday lectures throughout each semester. This semester, the theme is Discursive Practices, and you'll find a poster around our school with the lineup of uh, lecturers. Um, I'd like to say that tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Vice Provost's Office for Inclusive Excellence, and I think we have a few uh, representatives from the office today. We also invited uh, members from UB's Indigenous Inclusion Committee, and we also have representatives from the Seneca Nation here. Uh, and I would like to say that we honor and acknowledge the land upon which we are meeting uh, because it's the historic and traditional gathering place of Native American peoples. In particular, we uh, acknowledge the Seneca Nation and the Haudenosaunee uh, and thank them for their stewardship of our lands. It's my honor to introduce our uh, guest speaker for tonight. Uh, we are about to hear from Dr. Ted Pahola, and he's coming to us all the way from New Mexico. He got to see some snow this morning in Buffalo, but I think there was snow in New Mexico uh, when he was leaving. Uh, he is Distinguished Professor and Regents Professor in the Community and Regional Planning Program in the School of Architecture and Planning at the University of New Mexico. He has a uh, undergraduate degree in architect architecture from the University of New Mexico, a a uh, graduate urban planning degree from MIT, and a doctoral degree in political science from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He has been at um, the University of, Min of uh, New Mexico for many years, serving as the director of Native American Studies uh, since the 1980s, where he established an interdisciplinary uh, graduate undergraduate degree program in uh, Native American Studies. And uh, he is also the founder of the Indigenous Design and Planning Institute, which works with tribal communities by facilitating culturally informed approaches to community development. His areas of expertise include indigenous planning, indigenous architecture, human settlements, planning communications techniques, and community planning. And tonight we're going to hear about his uh, projects and programs in indigenous planning. So help me welcome Dr. Ted Pahola. My name is Ted Pahola, and I just want to, before I begin, acknowledge the wonderful hospitality of the Seneca Nation this morning. I got a chance to see a buffalo being butchered, as well as um, partake of some of the special indigenous cuisine that they fed us. So I'm really happy. And um, as the chair indicated, I came in from Albuquerque yesterday, but don't feel so bad about your snow because we had a huge storm that came in our area. Um, the time that I left, it was 21 degrees and they had to de-ice our plane. So, um, can you imagine that in New Mexico? In fact, one of the things that is very unusual is one of our Pueblo communities um, had its traditional feast day, and for the first time in my memory, they actually canceled it. So I'm assuming that they're going to have it this weekend uh, when the weather is better. So that said, um, I'm from the Pueblo of Isleta. I don't know how many of you had a chance to go to New Mexico, but if you know where Albuquerque is, and if you don't even know where that is, how many of you have watched Breaking Bad? Okay, so that's Albuquerque. We're, as we like to say, seven lucky minutes south of Albuquerque because we're also a casino gaming tribe. Although, unfortunately, urbanization has caught up, so the time is now more like about 20 minutes instead of seven minutes. But what can you say? It's progress, right? So I'm happy today to sort of share our efforts um, with regards to this area of focus that we call indigenous planning. And um, in a sense, give you a couple of things that hopefully will be a takeaway. I'm going to talk first about some of the kinds of principles that we use in indigenous planning. And then I'm going to show you some case studies of projects that we've worked with. And then I'm going to end with 
the basic tenets that we use in terms of uh, re-educating, how it is that we go about um, doing this within our program. And uh, I'm from the Community Original Planning Program, and I'm happy to say that several years ago, as a result of our initiatives with IDPI, as we call it, um, we have established the first concentration, graduate concentration in indigenous planning of any tier one university in the nation. And we're actually in the process of uh, putting together a proposal to do a PhD program in indigenous planning. So within my department, we have three native faculty, myself, Laura Harjo, who's Muscogee Creek from Oklahoma, has her uh, PhD in geography from USC, and also we just hired recently Lonnie Sinegeni, who's Navajo, who has her PhD in water hydrology from New Mexico Tech. So I'm really happy to say that we're firmly grounded and we're certainly not going to go away in terms of how it is that this is impacted with our School of Architecture and Planning. So um, with that said, what is the role of our institute? And in particular, what is it that really in a way kind of drives us in terms of our motivation? So as you can see there, our purpose is really to use culture identity and the world view as a way to help inform community development. And we're positioned within the School of Architecture and Planning in a way that is really, in a sense, um, germane to how it is that we begin to interact and influence the kinds of groups that we work with. So, um, of course, first and foremost, we're academic in nature and uh, we have lots of great relationships with other partners in Canada and in Mexico and in Ecuador for that matter. And um, this just sort of shows in a way, a metaphorical way, the kind of incidents that occurred in kind of a river diagram to show how it is that we emerged. So I guess, you know, from that standpoint, uh, we did, it wasn't an accident that we came to be, that in fact, there were many things that uh, led up to our institute and that from that kind of grounding and standpoint then uh, we saw this as the conjuncture of the kinds of groups that we uh, engage with and interact. Of course, key to this are the tribal uh, communities. We have many of them, of course, in New Mexico. We have 19 Pueblos. Um, we have Navajo Nation. We have two Apache tribes. Uh, we have the Southern Ute as well, too. And all of them, in a way, then, we speak of the kind of uh, challenges that we have, which I'll talk a little bit about in terms of how it is that we go and apply these kinds of principles in terms of identity and placemaking. And then our third area that we're also very much uh, attuned to is how we represent ourselves within the profession. And particularly in terms of architecture and some of the initiatives that we've launched, we found out that there is no voice there. And when I helped to establish the Indigenous Planning Division within the American Planning Association, there was no voice there. And landscape architecture, forget it. So in a way then, even though there were key people and continue to be that have really important roles and positions in this, they were never acknowledged as being Native. And I think that it's also part of our mission to sort of elevate that so that people understand that, in fact, as practitioners uh, and professionals, we really should be represented in our own unique way in terms of our accomplishments. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the principles that we use in indigenous planning and why, in a way, that it sort of helps to uh, distinguish us from a lot of the other kinds of disciplines. So first and foremost, I really want to reinforce the fact that these principles are actually specific to our pedagogy in terms of not just how it is that we inform what it is that we do, but we've also worked very diligently in developing a foundation of literature in order to support the kinds of uh, findings and theories and conversations that have gone on. And that it's a hemispheric conversation. We have partners all the way from Canada to New Zealand to Hawaii to Australia to partners in Latin America 
all of whom in a sort of synchronetic way are also building these same kinds of discussions. And the most important thing that we sort of serve, say, um, share in terms of this foundation is the idea of emergence and ancestors. The idea that in terms of our sense of place, it really comes then from where it is that we feel that we emerged and then uh, tuned ourselves and fixed ourselves to our own center places and that much of that history is actually uh, denoted by a lot of the kind of archetypal uh, migration spirals that you see in many regions of the world. So this migration spiral from our standpoint is really significant because part of what it is that was already a responsibility in terms of our awareness is when we emerged in our center places then it was up to our clans then to move in either a clockwise or a counterclockwise direction and each of those rings denotes then one completion of going to all the four corners of the world. So you can imagine then just how many millennia have been involved in doing this in my particular culture, my Pueblo tradition in our oral history, we actually can name 256 places that preceded us um, for the place that we currently uh, live in. So the other thing is that there is a different kind of nomenclature because we're taught in Euro-Western science that north is always on the top and that's how we interpret a map and we interpret the world. But in indigenous constructions, the most important direction is the east, and that's the one that's on the top. And that is because of uh, emergence and the renewal, and that's where the day begins. So that if you're ever reading any kind of rock art that looks like any kind of map, there's no way that you can build that uh, level of interpretation unless you know that you're actually looking at east on the top. But if we take this same migration spiral, and then we put it into a three-dimensional um, kind of notation, then you see this kind of bed spring spiral pattern. And what this indicates is that part of our way of discovery is through what we call transformational knowledge. And that's the idea that physically you begin in one place, but in terms of your collective consciousness, you actually move in whatever direction but you can physically come to your own place, but in terms of that consciousness, you actually elevate yourself to another level. So when we talk about sustainability, we talk about how it is that our ancestors and what it is that our communities do in terms of that journey to discover things and then to look at these things, but with the idea of bringing that knowledge back to our center place not verbatim, but to adapt it in order to help with our resiliency and sustainability. So that's counter to what we tend to see in Euro-Western practice, which is just kind of like the wholesale acceptance of outside ideas and values as they impact within your community. Ours is a translative kind of relationship that's very important to how it is that we've evolved. So worldview. Uh, I've often asked the question about, well, does indigenous pertain to me? I'm not necessarily native, but you know, I may come from a white ranching community in southern New Mexico or other places. And we say that the basic foundation of indigeneity is how a community has successively um, survived in the same place over successive generations. And when you succeed yourself in the same place over successive generations, then you develop an understanding of the world. And you know that some of the most passionate people in terms of the notion of their own worldview are people who have lived in that same place. They can be ranchers, they don't have to be indigenous from a tribal perspective, but they're just as passionate because the key component of that is how it is then that they understand the environment and the world about, around them and how they interpret it, uh, interpret that for themselves. So in this particular diagram here, this is an artist's rendition from one of our northern Tewa communities in New Mexico. And you can see just how well defined it's articulated in terms of that worldview. 
And some of the components that you see are the notion of boundary. And that boundary represents the ecology that's necessary in order to sustain the community in time and place. And then you see sacred orientations in terms of the cardinal directions, but you also see totems and sacred landscapes that are associated with that, which then are part of that interpretation that is then seen in terms of those other influences and ancestors from outside of our own human domain. And then we also see here in these corners the moieties. And these ones have specific roles, one's summer, one's winter, and they take on specific responsibilities in that cycle um, because of our <coughs> temperate climate in order to assure them that the human behavior allows then the nurturing and the repeating of this in time and place. So the main thing that we subscribe to is something called seven generations planning. And this is a schematic of a very famous um, archaeological site in New Mexico. And I don't know how many of you have ever had a chance to reference this, but it's called Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon. And um, what's important about this is that all the sort of science around it in terms of understanding is just now being acknowledged. And it has solstice orientations, it has lunar orientations, these uh, Kiva sacred places are referenced to the um, Milky Way, uh, to Orion Belt, uh, it just goes on and on. But the importance of this particular site is how it was actually created. Because a lot of people, especially in terms of our idea, is that everything's created overnight, right? But as they say, Rome wasn't built in a day, neither was this. And in fact, what um, the archaeological record shows is that it took approximately 140 years to complete and that there were actually seven phases, distinct phases, to the construction of this. So when we work with communities, we use this as a way to get people to sort of rethink how it is that they go about the evolution of creating what we call coherent places. Because the challenge is that the people who actually initiated this did not live to see it completed. And yet it still remained its coherence. So how did they do that? Because it was the successive generations then that were attuned and continued to do this. And at the end of this completion cycle then, it came out in this beautiful, coherent kind of uh, edifice. So, the idea of generation then is if you do the simple math, seven divided into 140, that's about 20 years. That represents one generation. And therefore then, talking in terms of a contemporary context, we get communities to try and imagine themselves as a middle generation, as I could with all of you here in this room, then who preceded you? Your parents, your grandparents, and your great-grandparents. And who come after you, your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. And all the times that we engage with communities to talk about visioning, almost uniformly they say, we want a healthy community. Well, we remind them that a healthy community is represented by all these generations within the community, whether or not they're affiliated directly with you, or somebody has that affiliation, all these seven generations are present. And if they're not, then that's not a healthy community. And what do you do in order to be able to intervene to take it to that point? So dealing with seven generations then from that kind of modeling then is really in a way uh, a sense of trying to get people away from the kind of practice which most of planners tend to fall into, which is, oh, let's put a 20-year time frame in or a five-year time frame or a 50 if you're really taking a risk. Well, when you raise that conversation of what is it that your next generation or two generations or three generations down um, going to do, or what is it that you has been informed from the previous generation, then you have a totally different kind of conversation. So um, the other aspect of what it is that we do in terms of being able to think about the kind of skills that you bring into these communities is 
the fact that land tenure is a really important variable within our native communities. Because as you can see, we were born in time and place. And land tenure carries a specific kind of principle, and that's the right of inheritance. So when we're born into our communities, that right of inheritance is that we will get what it is that our parents themselves uh, inherited, and that the role and responsibility of an individual when they have this is to make it better or to nurture it and care for it in a sustainable way so that those that are yet to be born will inherit it either in better condition or in the same condition. So land tenure is a deal breaker for many of our communities. And in fact, when that's not acknowledged, we find that a lot of dysfunction is introduced into the community. And all you have to do is ask some of your colleagues in reservation areas about uh, HUD housing as an example of that. Um, and I know in terms of this region, the whole impact of the Kanzua Dam and the relocation of people into these kinds of houses that have these kind of pseudo property values and nucleate the family are another example of that. So land tenure is a, uh, a really important kind of thing to acknowledge. But then at the same time, I'm trained as a Western planner. So I also have to apply skill sets that we learned in terms of land use, land control, zoning, all these wonderful things that you guys probably um, pour over when you drink your coffee. But um, again, these are things that are also realities within the way that we govern and look at the regulation of different types of uses within our lands. So the conjuncture of those is indigenous planning. That in a way that it not only looks at it from the standpoint of a seven generations framework, but it looks at it from the standpoint of how it's actually applied at the level of uh, a place. So, I want to go quickly into some of the case studies. I can't dwell on any one of them um, for any length of time, but give you an example of the way that some of these approaches have really impacted and affected the groups that we've worked with. So this just shows a, a map of, uh, we were established in 2011, and these are all the projects that we either have done or um, are negotiating or um, are in the process of being uh, thought about actually. This is already out of date. We have more projects than that. But as you can see, our reach is everywhere, not only within the region, but we've also done projects in Latin America as well, too. So um, I want to begin by talking about a project that we did at Isleta del Sur. And as you can see, this is located in the city of El Paso. And it's a community that um, came to us in order to help them assist uh, them to do a, a cultural corridor plan because the context of their particular community is that they're being encroached upon. Um, it used to be rural on the fringes of El Paso, but now urbanization has taken hold and uh, they're reeling from how is it that they protect themselves from all this encroachment because as they said, Nobody was respecting um, their community. So this is going to be an example of a seven generations plan. And um, the thing that is key is that in our discussions within the community about the values, then we took this idea of how is it then that the community and all the kinds of institutions which they have are actually in tune with the life cycle of an individual. And in order to be able to demonstrate this, one of the universal concepts that we have amongst many indigenous communities is the notion of a cycle of completion, a circle that's representing this kind of journey. And in this particular case, it's the idea of a person journeying in their lifetime within the community. So in order to be able to demonstrate this, what you can imagine is take this circle, take a tangent point, rotate it at a consistent rate along the axis and you come up with a sine curve. So if you can't imagine that, I actually have a little graphic here that hopefully will show you how it's done. Or maybe not. Okay, let's go. Oops. So there's that circle, there's that tangent, and as it moves across 
this line that it draws out that circle. So at the end, the circle is completed, but what it does is it actually fuses two things together because that straight line is the Euro-Western timeline. You start at T0 and then you go into the future, but then that sine curve is the actual cycle. So if you look at this, then you see the sign at birth, teen, adult, elder, and new generation. And then in those diagonal lines, you see then the values that they learn in their life's journey. And then ultimately, when they pass along, they become the ultimate teachers. But our conversation was the community was, so what institutions do you actually have that help to reinforce and validate that? So you can see in this community, um, they have the nation building hub, a multi-generational place, gardens and landscapings, senior activities. These things, either they were thinking about or they already had in place. But the aha moment was when they said, oh, so that's why we have our institutions. And this how, is how it fits into this kind of um, cycle within the community. So again, the goal and role is how do you make an individual a responsible person as well as to maximize their opportunity within um, the community itself. So this is what we saw when we first went in there, no respect, like Roger Dangerfield, right? So they had these signs up all over the place. You know, it's kind of like the park situation where they say no skating, no spitting, no walking the dog, no whatever, and then they have the audacity to say, this is your public park, right? Same thing in this kind of situation. So um, what we did was we went in there and began to have a way of building a conversation around, well, you're not a homogeneous place and many communities are not homogeneous in terms of their style of development and the focus of development. So what are these kinds of places and then how can you begin to interconnect them and how do you build a stronger sense of identity there so that when people go there, they know that they're in a special place. So that was our goal and task in being able to work with them and beginning to map this out. And because we're in a school of architecture and planning, um, we have skills and resources that we can bring in in order to have these conversations and then help them to imagine what it is that this might look like. So these are vacant places. Um, here's a better example, a vacant area that the tribe itself owns. And then um, we added uh, something that they can use in their portfolio to take that same place and actually begin to bring in some of the challenges they have with architectural standards, with public safety on the street, in terms of developing images, and saying that you know if they began to sort of develop this style of development, when somebody goes there, they know they're in this special place and therefore then they'll respect it better. And those of you that know reservation life know that the ubiquitous mascot of any reservation is a res dog, so we make sure that we stuck one in there um, just for good measure, except that when it's totally tame, no fleas. Um, so we pay homage to the res dog. So, um, the other challenge is what are your assets within the community? And this actual painting here is uh, within the tribal uh, council chambers. And it's a really romanticized view of what it is that the community used to look like. And of course, the center of that are the ditch systems, the water systems. It's right on the Rio Grande River, uh, not much rain, so they have to rely on that water in order to deal with um, growing crops and subsistence and so on and so forth. But this was their romanticized image. And the issue that we found was that they had basically turned their backs on that primary asset. So on your left-hand side, you see the way that it actually is. It's basically denuded. That water goes in and out. They don't access any of it. And we said, if you can return back to those assets, you can solve things like connectivity, uh, healthy trails, for walking, physical fitness, uh, developing canopies for the heat uh, sink that's there um, and dealing with recreation, all those things can return back to you so that uh, you'll never get back to that romanticized image, but it'll empower you in terms of how it is that you see your community. 
So another example that I'd like to bring in to your attention is House Pueblo. We work with them on an indigenous community comprehensive plan. And this is an example of how do you bring voice to a community because that's one of the things that we're totally committed to is bringing meaningful dialogues, not somebody coming in and saying you gotta do it this way or what usually happens is we have this idea, so what's your um, reaction to this? It's really more what is that dialogue that helps to bring out these voices in order to help inform how it is that you go about your vision or your future. So Taos Pueblo is a rural heritage site. Um, that's the traditional community there on the right hand side. But then, you know, I love this picture even though some of the Taos people don't like it, but that's a contemporary re reality. It's the ATV with the young girl there. That's the future generation, so kind of deal with it, right? So the way that we um, engaged in this was we worked with uh, a committee um, that was comprised mainly of their departmental heads and we identified who were the main stakeholders within that community and how then could we build meaningful conversations with them in terms of the way that they see the future growth and development of their community. So these are the 13 focus groups that we uh, worked with. Um, I love this picture because this was one of our former employees and she's working with these elementary school kids and of course you know with any of these kinds of uh, meetings you have to provide food right so we were carrying around all this stuff and all the groups that we met with the adults the elders and stuff were really polite they sort of took a grape and that was the end of that engagement these kids cleaned us out I mean swear there was just crumbs left after that so we learned a real lesson about buy twice as much as you need for these young kids, but they are high energy just like hummingbirds. <laughs> so we used uh, different techniques. Um, in this particular case, we asked them what were their favorite places, what were their most dangerous places, and then provided aerial photographs to help them um, position these. We also asked them using this model of, you know, what were your priorities that you see within your community, put the ones that are the most important in the middle and then as they go outwards. So we've generated a lot of information and discussion and our challenge was then how do we summarize it in a way that can actually communicate back into the community. So we did content analysis and we ended up uh, transcribing all of our audio tapes. Um, we generated somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200 pages of single space narrative text and the question was then how do we actually summarize this in a way then that could communicate. So we use this kind of infographic. The idea of then in this case, what were the things that they said from the standpoint of economic development that were positive. And each of these down here represents the group that said it in terms of color coding. And then we use the direct voice of these in order to be able to capture what it is that they um, indicated in terms of frequency of count were the main kinds of things that they identified. Um, and then uh, with the partner that we worked with, which was a professional consulting firm, ARC in Albuquerque, then they asked us to take this information and put it into these buckets, which are standard for a comprehensive plan. So we translated that in there, but um, again, developed graphical ways in order to be able to relay that information. So you can see economic development and all the kinds of key things that came out of this. And then from that standpoint, then the other thing that we um, value is this whole notion of reciprocity, that the community should hear about what it is that we found and also be able to comment in a way then that uh, allows us to further refine whether or not in fact we we're on target or, or not. So we developed a whole series of these kinds of um, community meetings after that. Another uh, example, Chaco Canyon, uh, which is also a, a national park. And this one um, is an example of land tenure because of just the complexities of the land use out there. The Navajo Tourism Department asked us if we would assist them in beginning to sort of build conversations around 
how it is that the surrounding chapters could opportune all the visitors, uh, a lot of them international, that go to the Chaco Canyon area, and how this they could develop that into um, economic development opportunities for them. So um, the first thing that we learned is it's complex. I know that um, the nations here aren't necessarily subjected to land allotment, but in the case of Navajo, they are. So that map that you see right there has all these different kinds of designations that are there. And each one has different rules, obligations, um, and um, as a result of that, it's almost impossible for them to sort of, sort of do some kind of comprehensive approach because every one of those requires separate negotiations. And if they don't agree to play, then basically everything kind of stalls down. But at the same time, then, you know, how do you develop uh, a proposal uh, of ideas that are really situated around how not only do you bring amenity for the visitors that are going there that would allow them to go into these communities, but one of the things that we found as a result of this is that amenity has to serve a dual purpose because many of these chapters don't have running water, they have very poor housing, they certainly don't have any uh, stores, uh, laundromats were a big kind of key issue, anything around water. So the reality is that if Navajo decides to do any style of economic development, it not only has to serve the visitors, it also has to serve the local population. And some of this conversation is around assets, what are the assets that you see in your community? Um, and the discussion there is what of these assets that you identify, what do you want to share, and what is it that you don't want to share? And I love this one from this particular chapter because even in this process of having them do these maps, um, they identify things that we never would have imagined. So you'll see right down there in this loop chapter, you see that there was a Japanese internment camp there. Hell, I didn't know that there was a Japanese internment camp within an Indian reservation. So obviously, you know, that has incredible historic significance. And the question is, is it present an opportunity for them? So this is just kind of a summary that shows the kind of challenges in this area. So here's the worldview construction from the Navajo perspective with all the kind of sacred mountains and the landscape and uh, values that have stories attached to them, and then the reality is on the right-hand side. And as a result of all those allotments, all those little check places there are not native lands. They're under BLM or under their state, and all of those are gas, oil, exploration sites. So even though this is a historic area that's protected, it's completely surrounded by all this um, mining and natural resource um, extraction that's taking place. So even though the National Park Service wants to give the pretense that this is a virgin environment, in fact, it's heavily impacted. So there are all these kinds of other issues besides just economic development in terms of environmental management. So the last uh, case study I want to show is Zuni Pueblo. This is one of our longest. It was supposed to be a semester thing. Started out as a Main Street project, and then we got funding from Art Place America, and we've been at it for four years straight now in this community. So we know a lot about this uh, place and a lot of the kinds of challenges, and I'm happy to say that we've made incredible headway with regards to getting them to think about how to um, reassess their own sense of place. So this is an example of placemaking. And uh, we began with Main Street as our um, source of funding. And the first thing we did was, because this is such a culturally, historically rich area, and the people have memories that go back millennia, was to figure out what's the best metaphor to talk about major events that have occurred that have transformed and changed this environment. So on the left, or on your right hand side, you see the migration stories of the clans to where they came to in this present place that they call Zuni Pueblo or Halona, which is the center place for them. But in one of the sites that's sacred to them, you see this um, rock drawing here that shows the spiral of the migration and then it shows the 
clan symbols and then shows this kind of zigzag pattern of how it is that they actually journeyed along the way. So we took that in order to build conversation in the community about what is it that impacted their community starting with the emergence and then going further in terms of time to the present and each one of those circles then identifies something that was significant to them that changed something in their community. So that conversation was then, how do you view change? And has it been progressive? Has it not? Where do you identify this? And how is it then that you can use this as a way to start building priorities about how you can go and check in those influences? So using the Main Street method, of course, we started surveying this road. And you can see it there, Highway 53. It's a state highway that intersects into the traditional community. So Helona is the traditional center, and that's where all the ceremonies take place, and everything outside of that is new and recent development. So the conversation was, what is there, and is it really serving your community? And in particular, how does it benefit the residents there, and how does it necessarily build opportunities? So immediately, um, there's this kind of challenge of how do you identify the kinds of things that are there in order to protect um, the kinds of activities that are going on. But then, uh, what is that visitor experience? In this case, this was actually law students that were part of an interdisciplinary team there. But you see all those res dogs there all furred out, uh, ready in order to uh, beg for food. Imagine somebody who doesn't know anything about that community, like if you guys landed there, the first thing that's going to come to your mind is what? Am I going to get bit? Am I going to get hantavirus from the fleet? <laughs> so, um, you know, all of these kinds of things build that kind of consideration of what is that experience for the visitor from the outside. The other thing that we also uncovered in this is relating to the land tenure predicament. So you see the main street and these are the properties along that. Many of them are vacant or there's businesses that have uh, been uh, declining and that are abandoned. Doesn't give any real sense of any kind of architectural style until you get to the historic village um, in Helona. And uh, we raise the question, well, why are these places vacant, especially from kind of a real estate standpoint? These are the most opportune places in order to be able to uh, build businesses. Well, Zuni Pueblo is the largest of the 19 Pueblos. It has 10,000 people. There's only three businesses in the whole uh, village. The comparable town in New Mexico, uh, like Aztec, which is about 10,000, they have about 120 businesses. So the challenge was, what is it that was inhibiting the transfer of these kinds of properties, and it was all based on land tenure. So you would see then the property numbers down here, the individuals, and the vacant lands were all contested spaces. In other words, their right of passing these lands was through um, the woman, because they're a matrilineal society, and in cases then where they were passed down and then people started fighting or they moved away or whatever the case is, it was unresolved. Nobody wanted to touch it, and then it was vacated, and then it was basically in the stasis. So part of our project was to develop codes for the tribe in order to help them figure out how is it in their constitution that they begin to uh, renegotiate and reassign these kinds of properties, especially with uh, the fact that the owners themselves would relinquish it, but maybe they could become part of that kind of enterprise stream. There were also other things attendant to this. It's a five-lane highway with the middle as a divide, lots of public safety types of issues. They didn't even have crosswalks. So, you know, how do you design those? Also, they don't have any particular place that is really uh, there that they can hold annual kinds of events like flea markets, even though that's a really big thing in terms of an informal economy. So, you know, how could we build these kinds of things using some of the kinds of design that we can bring into this community. And then staging it in terms of pop-up venues. If this were a vacated land, and this shows the final stage of a three-stage process, how they could actually create these kinds of spaces that also uh, protect 
and give uh, facilities to the ones that are there as well as the visitors. I mean, some of the challenges is they have no uh, paid parking there, so people just kind of stand on the side of the road. I remember seeing one big giant RV van pulled to the side there because they didn't know where else to park, and then the Zuni police came and told them to leave. I mean, that does not set a good <laughs> precedence for a uh, visitor that's coming in. And the economy is so informal that a lot of the people who sell these kinds of crafts do it on the street. It's estimated that 80% of all the households there in Zuni Pueblo do some arts and crafts, some of them as their um, life vocation. And they sell on the street. So they'll just come right straight up to you. Some problems are some of them are inebriated or uh, people don't understand why they're coming up. So there's that kind of uh, tension that exists there. But all they want to do is want to sell you something that they've actually made for themselves. And I remember one time I was going there with a colleague and I said, wow, these guys must be selling really good tacos because there was a truck parked there. And there were about 20 people that were lined up there. And it turned out that a dealer had come into the village, basically parked his truck and sent the word out and said, I'm buying today. He had literally his stack of bills this much and he was buying off of the street. And uh, the problem is, of course, that we know that that return is from the exchange, right? Not the wholesaler to the middleman, but the markup is where the middleman takes it to the outside. So they were basically selling their stuff at pennies on the dollar, and then the trader would go to Albuquerque and mark it up in some cases 10, 12 times what it is that they paid for that uh, item. So um, in some of the analysis we did, uh, one of our recommendations was to create what we call cultural buffer districts. The idea then that uh, the historic district would be protected and then the buffer districts then would uh, begin to in place ways in order to control the style of development and the type of development and the further away that you go, the more lax that it becomes. But that there's a steady progression um, that then essentially translates that movement of, oh, we're then finally getting to the ceremonial area. And you know, the last thing that they want to see is a neon sign there from a trader that's in a uh, trading store that's in that area. So um, this is a long-term effort, but we'll see what happens. Um, so when we uh, applied successfully and got an art place project, we shifted our conversation to how is it that artists themselves could participate in the redesign of the main street and make it more safe and opportunistic for them. But also in this particular case, then how is it that SUNY artists could position themselves better in terms of economic advantage? And those of you that don't know Zuni Pueblo, it's a world-famous destination um, in terms of these kinds of art, and they're really high production uh, pieces uh, in a myriad of ways. So one of the questions we raised even within the community is what is art? So the issue was not that they weren't attracting people. This is actually from the visitor center. And you know, you put a little pin in from where it is that you are but you not only see the Americas represented, but every other place represented. So the issue was not how to get people there. The issue was how do you build a meaningful connection with the artists? Because we know that if they then have the opportunity to engage with the artists and know the amount of effort and the meaning of this art, then it's value added to that product. So um, the reality is though that it's all about economic leakage because there's no businesses there. They certainly don't have property taxes or sales taxes from that standpoint. And they have to go all to the surrounding community. So they're losing, by one estimate, $30 million a year in uh, revenue that they could actually keep in their community and use that as a basis for um, improving their community. So, um, this is what we saw when we first went in there. A sign that's been up since the 1960s, 
all of these businesses are no longer there. They try to co-op. And what we were able to do then was rejuvenate it both through Main Street and what was going to be the Art Walk initiative um, of bringing this um, process for um, bringing people together. So we did a design build studio um, in order to manufacture wayfinding signs as well as identify artists who wanted to be part of what we were going to establish as a tour to studios. And um, this effort then was translating to how can we figure a way that people can identify places that they can go to. Because the issue with that is that there's no street signs there. And if you tell somebody, you know, find such and such, you have to describe, well, maybe there's a fence there or there's a brown dog there or something, you know. Um, so this then was a wayfinding system which we began to develop not only to um, identify where the place is, but also the type of art that was being produced in that uh, studio. And then to make sure that people didn't even stray further, we put breadcrumbs there, as we call them, painted rocks, in order to show that this was a location. And then uh, tours got organized around it. So the Zuni Art Walk tour basically involves their public transportation system, meeting at the visitor center, and then going through a defined route in order to go to all these various kinds of artist places. And then you get to actually go into their shop and see exactly what's going on. And this bus cycles every 15 minutes and stuff, so you can get on and off wherever it is that you want, but it um, has grown um, to the point now where they're thinking of doing it actually every month, which I think is a little bit over the top. Um, they were doing it like quarterly with um, some of their other activities which they're doing, but the latest word is we started out with seven artists originally and now there's 26. So it's growing, it's succeeding from that standpoint. So here's an example of this, and um, this is Noreen Simplicio. So part of the staging of this was also to bring a really quality presentation to what it is that uh, the artists were doing. So um, we also teamed up with a videographer who was local in order to begin to start putting these kinds of profiles together. But you actually go and see her doing this, and she explains everything. And then we developed these like little baseball cards that people could take away as part of the branding of this kind of thing. I'll see if I can bring up a video that um, is attached to this. So you can see the level of production that we've got now. I'll take this off mute. My name is um, Noreen Simplicio. Uh, I am a Zuni potter. Uh, I've been a potter for about 35 years now. Um, my first lessons were uh, taught to me by um, a woman by the name of um, Jenny Hati. She was an Akuma woman that lived here in Zuni and um, she taught in the school system. So that's where I took my basic um, pottery sessions. Um, there was also another lady that was a big inspiration in my life. Both ladies were big inspirations in my life. Her name was Angelina Medina. She was also Akimazia. She lived here in Zuni. Um, she had a, she was in the education system too, and she also had a pottery business on the side. So I worked for her a number of years. But um, I think I already kind of knew that uh, I was uh, my destiny was to to be a potter because I remember as a young child um, playing what, with mud outside and, and playing, making mud pots. So I think that was my best thing to be a, to be a potter. But um, I have my, my style of pottery um, is mainly like traditional pieces that I do. I also do a lot of um, contemporary pieces. Um, my special specialty, I think, is my Pueblo scene pots um, because they're very unique. All my pieces are hand done. Um, 
which makes them unique. And what's cool about it is um, when I go gather the clay, you look at the piece of clay, and it's pretty fascinating how how these pieces become such beautiful um, works of art. There's a lot of play sites in Zuni, but I've always come to this place simply because um, the play here is very, uh, very good by itself. It's very strong. But I've been coming here for about almost 30 years now. And um, when, I, when I first learned how to make pottery, um, I came here back in 1978. Um, it was a, I learned at the high school, so this was one of our field trips to come harvest clay and gather clay. But as you can see, um, the resource is being used a lot, apparently. So now, it's, it's, this is how it is now. You can barely get to the clay anymore. It's way deep in, inside the little canyon there. So it's kind of um, dangerous um, to gather clay here anymore. So I think um, this is going to be um, kind of laid to rest now. But um, again, I've been coming here for a long time. And, uh, it's got a lot of memories here. It's a very special place for, for us potters. And I think it's a very popular place. Uh, in our culture, we have a lot of um, things that we do before we actually get things from nature or from the earth. So actually, when before we start digging for the clays, we do offerings of prayer cornmeal and food. This is kind of like asking Mother Earth to be able to uh, get from her flesh and be able to use it in, in very positive ways. So I just want to get down here and show you what it actually is like to be way down here on that the very deep inside there, there's, there's clay deposit in there. And I always like to dig in there. Um, dedicated my life to the clay um, and um, um, it's, it's a very special gift that, that um, the Creator has blessed us with and um, I often like to share and teach whoever's willing to learn the art so I'm hoping that you know in the future um, I'll be able to teach and work with the youth and I have several um, members in my family that, um, that do pottery that uh, have been my students, like my son, he's a very good artist, and, and my niece and my nephew, my mom has tried it, and so those are the people that I'm hoping that will carry on my legacy um, someday, and hope that I um, always um, inspiring people and, um, as artists, you know, um, we all inspire each other. My name is Maurizio Cristo. I am a Zuniarist. So profiles were done on all these um, communities. And, um, <clears throat> I mean, all of these artists. So you can go to YouTube and just hit Denis Art Walk Artist and you can see more of their profiles. But again, this brings up that kind of level of professionalism and you understand now and you would probably be titillated to go meet the person and actually see something like this and then you understand why that pot costs $1,200 and not $200 and you'd be more willing in order to be able to <clears throat> To buy it. So just to show an example of all the partners that have been engaged in this, so it's not any one single entity, so our role is coordinating as well as providing a lot of this kind of technical assistance in all of this. 
So um, I want to go ahead and just uh, close on then what difference does it make in terms of our standing within the school and what kind of pedagogy do we use in order to get students to kind of rethink who it is and what it is that they are. So we have these tenants um, that are important to what we call the re-education of uh, students in terms of thinking about why they do what they do. So the first one is no, not minorities. And what that one attends to is this idea that <clears throat> it's just not the largest fish in the room that rules, but in fact, our communities, uh, you can go to some of these communities and not see an outsider all day. And it may not be a very large community, but that if you go in with this mindset of, oh, we're small, we don't matter, we don't negotiate, we don't, uh, we're not, we can't negotiate at the same table and so forth, and it, in, in, it influences the way then that you represent yourself. The other is no translators, and this comes from the fact that too often times we've seen uh, community situations where Native people come together and then somebody speaks for them. It may be a BIA official or an anthropologist or somebody else, but now we've come up to our own level of education where we can represent ourselves. So that immediacy is really important. And then the, the last one is no cultural amnesia, and we basically teach um, this idea of protocol and start with the fact that if you don't know who you are, then you better not be going out and asking people who they are unless you're really um, willing to reciprocate in that relationship. Because the only way you establish that meaningful dialogue is that if they know who you are, then they're forthcoming in terms of talking to you. Um, so that is really also another um, important component of this. So this is what it's all about. Um, this was actually drawn by a 12-year-old child from one of our most casino-rich tribes in uh, Albuquerque area, San Diego Pueblo. There are only 500 people there uh, that are enrolled. And um, the challenge that this young person saw is this idea of the spirit role as representing this kind of decision um, point. And on the upper left-hand side, you see the verdant landscape that's really invested in terms of this notion of culture and identity, the continuation of these language uh, and uh, the vernacular traditions. And on the right-hand side, you see the casino prominent, but really is a symbol of consumerism and individualism. So you see that as being desertified. And we also use this in the context of talking to lots of communities about this notion of arrested development. The idea that many of our communities are not coherent because it's been this on again, off again kind of situation where somebody comes in with a bright idea, uses a lot of money, and then suddenly they walk away and the money dries up and then you're left with that. Then you start up the next project and the same thing occurs. And then before you know it, it just becomes a hodgepodge of places that have no kind of coherence. And we end up creating worse environments than, um, than we want to. So the mainstay of our um, program are our native students. In our school, we have bragging rights. We have over 30 native students, the graduate program and undergraduate program. They're committed to their communities, so we are obligated to take their skills and then um, have them apply it in terms of these kind of community service uh, projects that we engage in. But at the same time, <clears throat> we're also cognizant that we have lots of non-native students, and it's just as important to wake them up to this kind of experience as well, too. Because the reality is that we don't have that many human resources to spread around, so any of you could come into one of our communities and do come into our communities as planners and designers, so you should be smart about it. You should be culturally smart about it. So we also pay attention to that. And um, that's me. So um, of course, I encourage everybody, if you've got any more questions or want to reach out to us or come into our planning program, it's still transfer. It's allowed. Um, <laughs> I was already trying to steal one student, Sydney, over there. Um, 
I almost got her to sign a memorandum of agreement uh, on the way back over there, but uh, being a Seneca here was also bargaining really hard and fast as well, too. So we'll see where she ends up in uh, another semester. So with that, I will thank you very much. So that's my... Thank you for this wonderfully rich presentation you've given us tonight. Um, from the beautiful sort of images and graphic package you've given us, which really let us uh, see the places of your presentations from stream restoration to urban design to children's artwork to the artwork of uh, artists. Uh, and I also wanted to say your um, community engagement is really deep and rich, and I think it's a model for uh, planner's engagement especially when we think about your engagement with um, indigenous cultures and uh, tribal communities and so forth. Um, but with that, I wanted to open it up to your questions, comments, and feedback uh, for Dr. Tahola. Thank but before you, you ask a question, you have to sing a song. Um, is it going to be native? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> um, as a Seneca, as I probably already told you, uh, now from them, and so I say now because I grew up near the Cataraugus uh, territory. So a couple things. I'm a I'm an alum of, of the MVP program here. Would like to do a little fellowship, not a fellowship, but a little one month. Spend some time out there, maybe a couple weeks, a month. I'd like to talk to you about that. But um, I remember a few years ago. Uh, I tried, there was an indigenous planning division of the APA, and I spoke with a um, uh, Oneida of Wisconsin woman who was kind of chairing it. And the last time I checked, there is no division with APA anymore, if you want to come in. But more, more importantly to what I'm, why I came today is, uh, I've been trying to reach out with, to people within the uh, various, um, uh, native native communities and organizations in terms of doing a um, kind of master plan an indigenous master plan for the city of Buffalo now as we know it's not it's not part of a territory it's not an actual territory however there are so many so many landmarks and sites and just uh, references to the the prior Buffalo Creek Reservation for instance and then just in indigenous knowledge in general, and that it seems, I don't know of anyone who's working in the area, but I'm looking to partner up with people on a, uh, not, in a not in a business way, but just a, a voluntary way, to see if there's some kind of uh, mapping, um, an overlay that can be done to create uh, a, a, co a coherent and cohesive uh, Indian or native or indigenous identity here uh, with regard to land and so on. So those those phrases you used, well incidentally I've got to say one one of when you were talking about haphazard development and so on, which 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 the city itself in Buffalo is well known for, but it, it called to mind an old a, a big uh, word or big phrase that I learned when I was in planning school, which is disjointed incrementalism. But your your phrases of coherent places, land tenure, cultural corridor, uh, placemaking seems to tie in with what I, is that I was trying that I'm trying to look for here in <laughs> Buffalo in terms of mapping of of streets, native names, sites. I'll give you one quick example, then I'll shut up and listen to you your response, but there is a current controversy, and I'm not up on all the particulars, um, there is a former burial ground um, uh, in a park that was the, the place that Red Jacket, uh, the orator Red Jacket, and also uh, Mary Jameson, the white woman of the Genesee, who lived you know, among the Seneca, were at once interred. Now, there's a charter school that wants to do expansion there. So this has become a big issue. <laughs> That's my former professor, Dan Retail. Yeah, okay. So it, it's become an issue. And, and my thought is, gee, if it was part of a, of a, of a master plan, identified as a significant site, 
perhaps there would be uh, some additional uh, uh, leverage that could be placed on the city or whoever is trying to disturb the, the monuments and the former burial ground uh, for charter development or school development. So any thoughts on any of all that? And thank you for coming. Okay, so two things. Um, yes, the Indigenous Planning Division died on the vine, not of its own accord, but because APA kept changing the rules. Anyway, long short of that is there is now a movement afoot to reestablish it, this time as tribal, plan tribal and Indigenous Planning Division. So that conversation is going on right at this moment. So if you're an APA member, join the interest group. The second thing is, boy, we got a project for you. We just received funding from Living Archives, an urban Indian um, placemaking project. And what we're doing is we partnered with the Downtown Arts Alliance for the city of Albuquerque, as well as uh, IDPI and about eight other partners in order to do um, the living histories of five sites in the downtown area that have meaningful relationships to Native people. Um, and this is basically to bring voice to um, the contributions that urban people, have, Indian people have made over the decades. Now what's interesting about that is the way that we're doing. It's going to use pop-up theater. We basically are doing the archives and the oral histories around there, and then it will be scripted and developed into a theater and we're using students from the Native American Community Academy uh, in order to stage these productions on the street. And these will be held in the early evening because we're also doing photo bombing so that when we go on the sidewalk there, on the sides of the buildings, we'll show what the history of the people are and the places that it looked like from that standpoint. So we're doing these um, in cooperation with the city of Albuquerque. So besides having a lot of fun around that, the real intent of it is conversations that we had with the urban Indian community and their issue with the fact that the way the city represents Native people is um, because of all the downside. So they talk about the homeless, they talk about the alcoholics, they talk about the drug users. That's the face of the Native person in the city of Albuquerque. And what we want to do is change that conversation because we're also going to have community discussions after each of these performances and then get people to respond to how is it that Native people can be represented positively. But at the end of the day, we're going to then put together a proposal that we'll present to the city in order to get a new center that uh, celebrates the accomplishments of urban Indians in the city. So that's the way we're going to start with that. And mapping would be included in that. And mapping is included in that. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to uh, kind of um, follow up with, with your with your question there. Um, my name is Ben Anderson. I'm uh, with the Senate Nation Planning and Development Department, and uh, you mentioned um, the kind of the place baby um, making mapping. Um, and there's territory in Buffalo. Uh, the, the part of Senate territory, but yeah, there there is um, more with Cattaraugus and Allegheny territories um, under the Seneca Nation's webpage. Uh, their G the GIS department, our division under planning, does a really good job with that and has that uh, kind of that storytelling, place mapping, making mapping um, of both the Cattaraugus and Allegheny territories. Um, I, I think that's kind of what you're talking about, something similar with Buffalo, yeah, yeah but that uh, that's something, um, yeah, our, our, our GIS uh, um, manager is also uh, the assistant director for planning um, and would be definitely a good person to contact about that, so, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Questions for Dr. Havola? I was going to see if I could bring up the map that we developed, but I'm looking really curiously here. Um, I think this will be it. Let me check. Yeah. 
So let's see. I think this might be an unfinished one, but I can't bring it up. Anyway. So question, another question. Yeah, All right, so um, Dean Seneca, I have a question for you, Ted. So the University of Buffalo <coughs> wants to get more involved in indigenous planning, get more involved in doing American Indian, Alaska Native stuff, uh, support a huge need, actually. What are the steps and things that the University of Buffalo should do in order to engage more in American Indian, Alaska Native tribal communities? Yeah. So I think the first thing is to um, find out what your assets are that already exist, whether you have native faculty, native students, people that are interested in this area. And then in the case of the School of Architecture and Planning, our faculty had a strategic planning session and we identified three tracks that were going to help inform our scholarship and our research and one of those came out to be indigenous design and planning. So that's the first step. And then the second step is um, to figure out what would be the best protocol. And I think, you know, uh, you begin by taking the people who are really comfortable in their nest and moving them out to another nest. So I think, you know, uh, the Iroquois uh, nation groups, especially Seneca, should invite the directors and the deans and maybe even the president and go out there so that they can see these kinds of things firsthand because all of those kinds of experiences really are transformative from that standpoint. And then once you do that, then you begin to start establishing your own target goal and seeing what's opportunity um, in order to actually be able to invest in uh, others that could potentially become faculty. And that may even require just um, identifying a person or persons that have potential and then mentoring them into their particular roles so that after the end of that process, you're actually growing your own and then establishing those relationships on the outside. And uh, also working with other faculty partners to be able to give them opportunity in order to be able to bring their studio experiences and student experiences there. Um, we just have one faculty in landscape architecture, for example, who's worked with us. That's one of our affiliates. She's non-native, but she just uh, had worked in a community in Mammoth Nation that was impacted by uranium, the largest uranium tailing spill in the country in the 70s, contaminated everything, um, and the people from the community came to the school asking if there was some way that we could assist them in creating a new housing area for them in the higher area, but not just creating a new housing area, but a sustainable off-the-grid housing project. But in that process, we learned that they had been hosting all these international groups from Mongolia, from Japan, from Russia, who wanted to come and converse with them about the impacts of uranium contamination. Anyway, long story short, she just got an award from NEA. National Endowment for the Arts in order to begin work on developing a peace memorial at that site. So I mean all of these are kind of like really cool things but they really come from how do you provide that opportunity for that type of engagement. Hi, thank you so much for coming up to the Northeast. My name is Summer Sutton and I'm here with Angelica. We are from, Gilles. yeah, yes, and we're part of the uh, indig Indigenous Scholars of Architecture, Planning and Design at Yale School of Architecture. And um, I want to follow up on that question and ask about what universities and schools can do if they have a very deep, long history of contentious relationships with the indigenous communities in the area. How can these sorts of institutional um, programs help to, um, I guess, repair or create new connections with those communities when you have those histories um, that go centuries beyond the school's existence or the architecture school's existence. Um, so what would your recommendation be for reestablishing those relationships? I think the principal one is know who your advocates are or help to develop advocates right within the institution. 
Because institutions are strange animals. I mean, universities, they're really Byzantine institutions, and they really adhere to um, this kind of status. That's why we go through these hoops of being assistant and associate and then full professor. In my case, I beat the, even those odds by becoming distinguished and regents. I'm the only one that holds that stature in the whole school of architecture and planning. So from that standpoint, you know, people have to sort of listen to what it is that I say so I can advocate from that stance. That said, I've been at the university since 1980. So right now my whole activity is around a succession plan because I hope to retire in the next four or five years because I'm not immortal, unfortunately. So therefore then, it's really in a sense being able to nurture that point of advocacy within um, your institution. In addition to that, however, it's also why are you doing what you're doing? And in the case of the University of New Mexico, in my role there, we built a brand new School of Architecture and Planning in 2004. Beautiful building by Anton Predock. He's a world-recognized architect. It's a beautiful edifice. Lots of, you know, state of the estate um, kind of stuff in the building. And my position was, this is a public university. So when is it that the school and this facility is also going to be accessible to the tribes because they're also part of that public? So a lot of the programming that we do then is really done on that basis of how can we bring the tribes in and get them to sort of also realize and make, if you want to say, their own demands on how the university and the school can reciprocate. So that's part of that. Um, as well, too. But I think the key in that is, is the advocate. Who's the advocate? We have time for one or two more questions before we finish up. That said, I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we want to thank uh, Dr. Hohola for a wonderful visit. He's got had a, a wonderful day today. I did mention that he had some tours. He got to see some indigenous farming and meet some of our uh, leaders with the uh, Seneca Nation. So we were very happy to show off uh, what we have here as well as learn from his expertise. Uh, thank you so much and please uh, keep up with our Wednesday lecture series and come back again.